Okay. So yeah, real war stories. I'm I haven't f read the whole comic myself, but I've read about half of it. Two stories, and I really liked it, so I wanted to read it on my show. Nothing watered down in this comic, let me tell you. It's going to make you think. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> if I say anything more, people will get mad at me. Anyways, alright. Uh, so the first story is The Elite of the Fleet. A story of Tim Merrill, as told to Mike W. Barr, writer, and Brian Boland and Mark Farmer, artists. Alright. Are we good to go on this? Okay. So don't think of this as an interview, Tim. Just treat it like a conversation. Now, why did you decide to join the military? Well, I was... I was bored, actually. I had a job, but I wanted some new experiences in my life. I figured I could just use a little discipline in my life, too. But there was no way I was going to join the Marines. They shoot people. So you decided on the Navy? That's right. I've always been a gadget maniac, and I thought I'd like to learn electronics. I joined on the DEP, the Delayed Enlistment Plan. I signed the papers in October and didn't have to go until February. It's like buying a car on credit. But I started paying for it as soon as I hit basic training. They do everything they can to intimidate you. Let you know who's boss. Give me an example, Tim. Sure. The recruiter gives you a list of things to bring to camp. Personal items, soap, things like that. But as soon as you get there, they take it away from you. Your only link with home, and now it's gone. And I guess I don't need to tell you about the haircuts and the uniforms. It's all designed to make you a part of the unit, not an individual. I didn't like giving up my individuality, but I managed to put up with it. For a long time. I put up with a lot. I should have realized what, I, what was happening when I saw the classification officer. I signed on for electronics, as I said, and the jobs I was offered were ship steward, mess management specialist, and other menial jobs. I told him I didn't join the Navy to be a cook. I used to hire cooks. He told me to hang on for a second. Then he said he had found an opening for a sonar technician in the submarine service. He said there were no more openings for STS on the surface fleet. I found out later this was an outright lie, but at the time... It didn't seem so bad. I had joined the Navy for adventure after all. That was one of the first of a lot of casual compromises I made. They didn't seem so bad at first either. So you became a sonar technician? That's right. And that wasn't what I thought it would be either. But, well, there's something you have to understand about me. You see, I consider myself a Christian. I believe in Christ. And I try to follow his teachings. But you enlisted in the military. Uh-huh. You see, I didn't figure sonar training had anything to do with weaponry. I thought it was just, well, steering. I figured I couldn't kill anybody working in electronics. And I was encouraged to go to sonar school. They needed a black sailor there as an example, to be what they called a hot runner. I was opposed to war, sure, but it was an opinion, not a conviction. Okay, when did it become a conviction? Not until after I officially joined the submarine service. They're a special group in the Navy. The elite of the fleet, they call them. It made me feel pretty good that I qualified to join them. But it wore off when we engaged in war games. We were supposed to trace and destroy another sub. The Ruskies, they called them. Of course, we only fired water slugs. Fake torpedoes at them.
But I have to admit, it's a rush that never been equaled in my life. I liked it. Then we found a real Soviet sub one day and followed it for a long time. That's when it stopped being a game for me. But a lot of the other sailors got really excited. One of them even wanted to destroy the sub. And that's when you realize you were dealing with real lives. That together with another incident. Somewhere I picked up a book called The Fate of the Earth about the effects of a nuclear war on the planet. Any other time in my life, I might have read it and said, how terrible, and that would have been the end of it. But we were carrying nuclear weapons. And as sonar technician, I'd give, them, I'd give the missile room the target coordinates. That's when it hit me. Our sub could be responsible for starting World War III. So when it came time for my PRP interview, my personality reliability profile, they asked me if I would draw my gun on a fellow sailor who trespassed in the nuclear weapons area. By that time, my opinions had become convictions. I said no. You said no, even though you knew that the, gar that the guarding of the nukes was part of your duty? Nobody ever told me I'd have to guard nuclear weapons. Just like they never told me my sonar was part of the weapons division. I wasn't told that until I was in the navy, too deep to get out. I think they purposely withheld that at the recruiting stage. I thought I'd failed the PRP interview for sure, but I passed. They probably thought I'd come around later. There was never any, ch there was never any chance of that, but what happened next guaranteed it. I was on guard one night and found a young sailor lying on the floor sobbing. He'd been violated. Greased, they call it. It's common on Navy vessels. Some guys grab one of the smaller recruits, shove a grease gun up his, up his rectum, and go. And that's common? Sure, the small man, the guy who can't or won't fit in, falls prey to the larger man. Officially, it doesn't happen, of course, but it does. All those incidents made me realize I really didn't belong in the Navy, but the Granada invasion brought it to a head. I was afraid our sub would be sent there, and I did not know why. So I did the last thing the Navy wants you to do. I made up my own mind. I found a library and research for a long time, and decided I couldn't go to Granada to fight. I wouldn't. My family has roots in Granada, and I wouldn't kill someone who might be family. I'd heard about the consentious uh, cons objector status to the Navy Times, which is a civilian publication, and decided to apply. I knew this would cause some waves. I was what they called a PBM, a personable black male. The ratio of black sailors to black officers is a lot lower than the ratio of white sailors to white officers, and they felt I was officer material. You mean they wanted you to be an example to other black sailors? Oh no, I'd be a token, not an example. The guy they'd trot out every time someone pointed out the black to white officer ratio. But you did receive CO status? Finally, it took a couple of months. Some people thought I was communist and others couldn't understand at all, but I got out. So what's your impression of the whole experience? Was it a waste or... It wasn't a waste, no. I found out more about myself and what I believe, but it would have been the same if I had gone in to learn a trade. Sonar is good to know if you're in the Navy, but where can you use it in civilian life? Not many civilians with their own private fleet of subs, I imagine. Right, you can get a good education out of the Navy, but at what price? You can get a better education as a civilian, and you don't have to give up your personal freedoms or serve on a war machine. I know. Are you going to school? Yeah, I'm majoring in history, part-time and working on the side. But the best thing is, I know I'm what I'm studying and what I want to study on my own terms. Thanks for everything, Tim. Good luck. I'm not the one who needs it anymore. Not anymore. That's the first story. And draw your own conclusions. I've drawn mine. The army will, the, the recruiters will, 
say anything to get you to sign that dotted line and then they'd put you in. They're just nothing but lies. Nothing but lies. Alright. Tapestry, part one. <clears throat> I grew up in Perkasie, Pennsylvania, where the shoe repairmen knew the sizes of everyone in town. My father was a minister and every Memorial Day I decorated my bicycle with streamers, red, white, and blue. And then it goes to like present day, so he talks about his past and it goes to, well not present day, but to um, when he was uh, getting recruited and put into war. <clears throat> so it goes back and forth. Uh, Paris Island Boot Camp, June 1966. Standing, six scared, emptying. Standing, sick, scared, emptying our pockets beneath naked bulbs, deafened by drill sergeants. No keeping photographs, ladies. Is this your sweetheart? She looks like a whore. Probably laying your dad right now. Hey, nigger, your mother a monkey? Every school day began with the Lord's Prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. Sometimes we had an atomic bomb drill sitting in the halls with our heads between our knees and hands clasping behind our necks. Hoi An, February 1967. I'm collecting civilian detainees temporarily held for questioning. Mostly old men, women, and children. Bound hand and foot with wire, they're thrown over the tractor sides and stacked like cord wood. I hear bones breaking. At Halloween, I collected money for UNICEF to help children in countries less fortunate than my own. Leaving food on a plate at mealtime brought a stern astonishment to the remember the starving millions in China. Hoi An, April 1967. The eight-year-old boy has a grenade. I shoot him before he can flip it into our jeep. We are in the town center and the explosion kills two Vietnamese civilians. My younger brother was only twelve. Once sneaking with Jeff Allison into his father's bedroom, we found the Silver Star on velvet in a black box. My favorite toy was a battery-operated machine gun with flashing red barrel. I mowed down thousands with it. Barrier Island, Go Noi River, August 1967. I am escorting six elderly detain detainees across the hot island, hot sand, when the sniper opens fire. Terrified, one of the old men runs for cover. Hands wired behind him. I shoot him in the back as ordered. Every Sunday for 15 years I went to the United Church of Christ, my father's church. I'd ask God to forgive my minor transgressions, knowing guiltily in my heart that I'd repeat them almost immediately, knowing he knew it too. Hoi An, September 1967. Sweeping the horseshoe for VC, we find a tiny Buddhist temple inside brightly colored tapestries hanging from the walls. Hofstadter says, let's knock it down, and Wally asks, why, and Ho Hofstadter says, why not, and so we do. The year Kennedy died, I wrote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, on my high school notebook. Life magazine ran pictures of U.S. Army helicopters over the rice fields of Laos. Hoi An, September 1967. I'm with Sergeant Trin Arvin who's just quit. His mother's been killed by American artillery. You Americans aiding robbers like Thew, like Thew, Thew while driving the poor from their homes, insulting our women, grinning like fools as you smash our temples. Your father is a priest, Corporal Ar Erhart. In 1964, I worked as a lifeguard at the municipal swimming pool. By the end of summer, I had learned how to kiss with my mouth open and could drink almost a whole beer before I got silly. Hugh, February 1968. My year in Vietnam is almost over. I'm sitting in an abandoned house, heating coffee over a burning chip of C4 explosive. The anti-tank rocket smashes in through the window, missing my face by a foot. I don't hear the explosion or anything else for the remainder of my tour. Just before graduation, a girl asked if I was really joining the Marines. I said yes. She said, they'll send you to Vietnam. You could get killed. 
I said, I know, gazing bravely over her shoulder into the middle distance. You're crazy, she said, but I really admire you. Percocene, March 1968. I'm home. My girlfriend won't see me. I'm too young to buy a beer or my own car. Or, or own a car. At the Chevy Chase Motor Lodge, they refuse to serve me. A lot of the Penridge students eat there, and I might cause trouble. At Philadelphia Airport, boarding the bus to Paris, to Paris Island boot camp, the Marine Sergeant gave me the folders for all the recruits and said I was in charge. My parents' young brother and girlfriend stood looking on. I thought my heart would, I thought my heart would burst with pride. Percocy, March 1968. I go out and the girls won't dance with me. I get drunk and throw up in the men's room. I feel lonely and used. I feel defiled. The brilliant tapestries lie torn amidst the rub rubble. The temple is shattered. Shattered beyond repair. <clears throat> Tapestry tapestries, Part 2 1970, as Swarthmore College's only veteran, I mostly attracted morbid, cur morbid curiosity. It was shortly after a tense Christmas with my new girl's, with my new girl Pam's folks. Her friend Faye asked the worst thing I'd done, and I told them. At the bottom of, the, of a mortar pit in Hugh, the starved refugee lets us take her, one after another, for sea rations. Probably she has children. My turn. I descend in the rain, in the rocket light. May 1970. Pam returned from an anti-war meeting. Angry and confused about my feelings. I picked a fight for no reason. She laughed. I hit her. She threw me out, hating myself. I got drunk. Waking, I learned that guardsmen had killed four kids at Kent State. We're driving through this mark place in Hoi An, and there, there's this eight-year-old kid, and he's looking at us, and oh god, he's got a grenade. I raise the M16. My finger moves. Claiming de-escalation, Nixon extended the war. I'd extended the war. I'd, I'd fought for a lie. In 1971, I demonstrated in Washington. Police gave us two minutes to disperse, sealed the streets, preventing this, then charged with clubs and shatterproof faces. Was this how I'd look to them? The country, the count, the country fair is a counterinsurgency operation. We moved through the villages, ordering people outside for inspection, herding captives before us. Occasionally, a suspect hooch erupts into a fireball. Bamboo needles fall, trailing threads of smoke. Nineteen eighty-five. Trying to resolve my past, I return to Vietnam amidst vast sugarcane fields. Mister Duck's friend proudly display, displayed his prize. It's part of an American rocket I made into a water pump. I like it better as a water pump. In Hue, the water for the, for the coffee is about to boil. The B-40 rocket comes through the window, misses my face by a foot, explodes against the wall. There's a terrifying silence. Mr. Duke took me to see Mrs. Na. Weeping, she indicated five certificates. I gave five sons to the revolution. All are dead. You did this to me. She didn't say, you Americans. She said, you. Roddenberry's dead. Maloney's moaning. Three Viet Cong are running down the road towards me. I throw myself prone and fire. One of them snaps upright, toppling backwards. In the pagoda of the sleeping Buddha outside Vu Tao, a monk offered me three incense sticks to burn in a vase. As I left, he was hammering a bronze bell, waking the spirits to receive my prayers. Using a, sam using a sawhorse as our battering ram, we demolish the temple in the clearing. Before the roof collapses, I take two of the painted vase, vase Buddhists used for burning incense. Souvenirs. 1986, Vietnam's war was dead, but its spirit wouldn't lie still. I visited Nicaragua and Honduras to see what was happening there. I rode to San Jose with Flavio Carmen and their daughter, Quetzalina. Contras shot Flavio's brother as he was picking coffee. Crossing the rice fields, I see the figure in black pajamas running alongside the paddy dike. I shout, Dung Lai! 
Halt. Then fire. The figure crumples. It's an old woman, maybe 50. Nobody, nobody can figure out why she ran. Honduras. I visited the villa of the Nicaraguan Contra Group, FDN, who dismissed the reported slaying of 34 civilians as Satanista propaganda. Leaving beyond the villa's rose-decked walls, I saw the hillside shacks of the Honduran poor. I am offering Sergeant Tr Trian his favorite red licorice, but he's angry. You Americans help whores and pimps while relocating ordinary people in tin cages where they can only hate and die. You are worse than the VC. The evening before returning to the U.S. and my pregnant wife, I talked with Flavio while little Quetzalina slept. Her, name's, her name means Queen of Birds. I hope my child would never be sent to Nicaragua to fight her. The child is falling, dropping the grenade. I'll try to tell myself that some gorilla gave it to him, and that he didn't know what he was doing. And there'll be nights I'll wake up sweating cold certain that he did. Imagine living with that. Nineteen eighty seven. Home again, looking around, I recall George jo George Ravina's words back in Honduras. Contra A will radicalize the Satanistas, not defeat them. Mr. Reagan's policies push Honduras towards war. God blinds those who do not love. Yep. It's 1966 and I've just enlisted in the Marines to fight for freedom and democracy in Vietnam. My picture is in the Perkasie News Herald standing on the high school steps with my recruiting officer. I made a decision to fight in Vietnam based on the information my country gave me. Published in 1971, the Pentagon Papers revealed I'd been misinformed, sent by liars and power brokers to kill rice farmers. Home from Vietnam, I'm in a dance bar where none of the women will even talk to me. I get drunk by myself, then stagger into the men's room and throw up a whole war. I learned my lesson, spelled in bloodstains, deep and indelib indelible. Now it's 1987, hawks gather over Central America. Old lies are dusted off and displayed. I don't want more children to die for those lies. Not my children. Not anybody's. In the temple ruins, bright tapestries lie torn. Before its collapse, I took two vases burning incense in them. The Buddhists strike bronze bells. They believe if we do this loudly enough, the spirits will wake and receive our prayers. Alan Moore wrote this story after talking to W.D. Erhart and reading his three books Vietnam Percasy, Marking Time, and Going Back. That's a powerful, that's a powerful uh, two part story. Real, real is uh, anything else that's real. <clears throat> False note. Nancy's story is told to Joyce Brabner. Those bags of people? Shut up. Yeah, body bags. Every night for as long as I can remember, my parents made us watch the news about Vietnam. And then they would fight about it. Mom was anti-war. Dad was an ex-marine. When he was drunk, he would go on and on about the good war. World War II. Crash. And that's the way it is. Said the TV. Said the TV. What I really wanted to do when I graduated was to study music, then be a concert pianist and travel, playing the nightclubs. My parents said that was no way for a woman to make a living. T typical. Mom and Dad finally broke up my senior year. I got sent to a small college that I hated. I wasn't allowed to study music. One toke. Get lost. 
All the kids were into party till you puke. I wanted to be doing something with my life. I dropped out after six months and got a job in the supermarket. My father never spoke to me again. He died in 1980. I felt I was wasting my life. Throwing rocks, your daddy hid 404 in college to pre protect your butt. Where do you get off? Pardon me. Dinner. Returning troops were met by protesters today at the airport. I had been in peace uh, marches and demonstrations since high school, but it really bothered me when Vietnam vets were booed and hissed down when they tried to speak. Peace? Love? Crap. I always argued about this with my friends. They were drafted. They didn't start the war. You're so naive. Those guys went because they wanted to. How can you condemn those guys when you aren't willing to put yourself in their place? I didn't know enough about the world to convince them, but I'm, I'm not afraid to go and find out. Anyone want to come with me? I'll tell them I want to enlist. That should give me a good idea of what it would be like. If I did join, I could probably help change things from inside. It's not like they'd send me to Vietnam or anything. I thought nobody could make up my mind except me. If they, had, if they had said, go in as a typist or something, I would have just said, kiss off. But there it was, army band. If you pass your audition, we'll send you to music school for a year. You won't see any fighting, but you'll have to do a lot of traveling. Are you up for the challenge? The audition was hard. I passed. I was proud of myself. I didn't tell anybody until after I had enlisted. No one in my family believed me until they saw me packing. Gonna be a baby? Uh, gonna be a baby killer for Uncle Sam? I can't understand it, but if it's what you want. Mom always knew better than to yell at me. Basic training is rough for everybody, and I was no jock. But I caught on quick. Just do what they say, don't draw attention to yourself. It'll all be over in a few weeks, so who cares? Sleep on the floor so your bed isn't messed up for inspection. I hated combat training. What a stupid waste of time. How many chances do piano players have to shoot the enemy? Play the game and get out. Except for all the talk about killing, basic was kind of like outward bound. Go Nancy! When it was all over, you felt like you could do anything. I wish there was an autofocus on this thing. Like, seriously. <laughs> just, I don't know. It just seems kind of fuzzy. Anyway. Jump school was terrifying. You can cripple yourself. A lot of guys mess up their backs. Women paratroopers in Israel found they couldn't carry babies to term. My knees are shot. I did not graduate first in my class this time. You're nothing but a damned female! Worthless! Get us all killed! He loves his little sweetheart. You know what she'll be doing to pass this one. Daddy's girl! After jump school, I was sent to Fort Bragg to be an MP. I realized I could have just turned around and gone home. We got no broads here. You'll have to find your own quarters. And they never would have missed me. The first six weeks, I did nothing. They said I was an inca incapable partner because I was a woman. I fought them. Th then they relieved me of my duty. They said I was a lesbian. I knew three other women at Fort Bragg. They were all married to officers. In society at large, there's gay rights. One in ten women are lesbians. It's their business. We've been watching your movements. We know all about you. Cooperate with us now and we'll give you a general discharge. In the army, they can lock you up, take away your job. I spent a month and a half doing nothing but picking up cigarette butts while I was investigated. It's still on my record. Eventually, more women were admitted to my unit. Each one would be there for a few weeks. 
then be relieved of duty inve and investigated. Dyke! When her reputation and attitude were ruined, she'd be let back in. I finally got to work as an MP. My first assignment was to transport a guy who raped a three-year-old. He thought I was really funny. Eight hours a day arresting drunks, speeders, prostitutes. Every new partner I got had to learn I don't mess around in the bushes. I figured I'd be safer with a dog, so I worked K-9 patrol. I was assigned to the rapes. The victims enlisted women. It happens every other night. The first thing they're going to ask you is if you use birth control. I know, it's stupid. What they should ask is how bad you're hurt. Don't let it rattle you. After it, they're dismissed for not being able to adjust to military life. MPs handle family fights. The guy would come home drunk, beat up his wife often. She didn't speak English, brought back from Southeast Asia like a slave, washing clothes outdoors on a rock for a guy getting free housing and plenty of bucks. Army woman, you're either a whore or a dyke. I'm still told that. Two people with knives at each other's throats. Ugly. All those cracks about a great way to meet men? It works the other way. After you've shared a foxhole with a guy for six weeks, you just want to get away from each other's smell. They call them war games. That's probably when I realized that I was living in a society I was supposed to protect everyone else from having to live in. I was an idealistic jerk for ever thinking I could have changed anything. But I'm still glad I went. I learned something about the world and myself. I don't wish the military on anyone. It's insane. It exists for one reason. Organized killing. Look before you leap, I tell kids. Boston, 1987. No one was joining the all-volunteer army in the 70s, so they went co-ed and allowed women in combat positions that means killing someone or being killed, but those are the only jobs that get promotions. In the 80s, they cut jobs for women so women can only work 60% of the jobs a man could get. The mostly dead-end jobs like file clerk that will last until they decide they need woman, woman again like what happened to me. I was supposed to play piano. Only 1% of the jobs you get in the military actually give you high-tech training. The unemployment rate among veterans coming out of the military right now is over 25%. If you're from an inner city slum, that might be better odds than at home. But it's a lot worse than the national average. Do you think they'll ever draft women? There's legislation before Congress now that says that if we have a draft, then we will draft women. And this isn't the first time they've had that idea. During World War II, Roosevelt thought they were going to have to start conscript conscripting nurses. The solution? Enlist black women, as long as they only nursed black soldiers. That gave white nurses more time to nurse white men. I was regular army and now I'm just getting out of the National Guard. You'll find a lot more women of color in the service than going to a school like this. That's racism. For some of us, it seems like our only chance to get away from home and do something with our lives. What they never tell you is about double discrimination, both as a woman and for your color. You get beat down all the time, and then they tell you to be proud you're military. You see officers doing it. Hey, hey, brown shirt. How come you taste so good? Just pathetic, man. While well, financial aid dries up, uh, ROTC gets bigger. They're drafting us already, the economic draft. They did that to nurses in the 70s. They would go in, promise to pay off all their school loans, and said they wouldn't send them to Vietnam. They got sent. December 1986, a 20-year-old woman, army sergeant, was killed in the Honduras. They don't tell you that in the news. When we watched the body counts during Vietnam, they never mentioned women. The networks didn't think the American public could handle the idea women were supposed to be protected. Oh, that was a period before that. <laughs> women were supposed to be protected. That's a new sentence. 
I would have thought as a teenager who lived through the Vietnam War you would have known better. You are all living through a Central American War. What do you know? I got invited to the Phil Donahue show when they set up a satellite to talk to women in Leningrad. We disagreed on everything. A Soviet woman wanted to know what was in our purses. The American woman wanted to know if they were being monitored. I got up the nerve to ask them how do they feel about having their sons and husbands in Afghanistan. It was the usual, well, it's necessary, and I said, I don't care if it's necessary. How do you feel? We concluded that war is something made and perpetuated by men. None of us have any interest in waging a war. It's an, anar it's an archaic way of settling differences, and all it does is kill the children that we go to through hell to give birth to. They edited, they edited that part of the show out. Go figure. Go figure. So it's this. Mm. U.S. troops in world battlefields. Huh. Wow. Nothing happening in the USA, apparently. Or Canada. Barely anything on this on the western side. There's everything on the eastern side. <laughs> So what does blue mean? Less oh military people based for less than one thousand. Canada, Greenland, and Antigua, Norway, Johnston Atoll, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, and Australia. The US has more than three hundred major military installations abroad covering two million acres. This is the world's largest, most elaborate foreign based basing system. I don't know why the camera's gradually getting lower. <laughs> Anyways, um, alternate service. A short saga brought to you by Steve Leola. Leo Leola. <laughs> I can't say that last name. <laughs> Hope you guys are enjoying this. Probably a little bit shocked by it. These are real war stories. I spent two years in the service of our country. It wasn't the usual deal, but here's how it came about. As a kid, when the fleet came in, I loved to check it out. The best part is blowing up the sampans and watching their little bodies flying through the air. How could you tell which side they're on? Oh, they're so far away, it doesn't matter. That and watching the skies. 200, 201, 202, 203, wow, they're all B-52s heading out over the Pacific. 8th grade, spring, 65. It all gave me a lot of time to contemplate war. Vietnam, Vietnam, something I can't read there. Vietnam B, I don't know what that is. My place in it. So I became a draft counselor. Can I get out if, if I think I'm an orange? Am I too thin for the army? How can I join? College of San Mateo 70. Which came in handy because I got drafted. All those up to number 95? Congratulations. 92. Split the country, go to jail, join up, become a conscientious objector. Okay, now what do I do? As a conscientious objector, I was to do two years alternative service, and Ronald Reagan had come up with just the ticket. 
the California Ecology Corps. I lived and worked with a hundred other I lived with a hundred other COS in the hills of California. The Calaveras Ecology Center. Of course it wasn't all fun and games, but at least we weren't out shooting anyone or getting shot at. They kept us busy too using chainsaw chainsaws and brush hooks working out on the fire fire lines with prison inmates. Some of the work was artistic. I painted every outhouse in Calaveras, Big Trees State Park. We also dug ditches, built buildings, cut fire breaks. The two years sped by like, well, like two years. Afterwards, many continued their alternative service work into their own time. To this day, some are still firefighters, captains. One guy became a hospital orderly, stayed up and stayed with it, and rose to the head hospital and its staff. I don't like how they use the ant symbol, it looks like the number 8 to me. Another runs a home for the handicapped. And me? I drew this for you because it's a big world out there and a million ways to go. If the military is not for you, you've still got a lot of choices. I did. Okay, enough about that. Up next is Andy Ma Andy Mogger. People have the weirdest names, I swear. <laughs> The decision, Andy Mogger's story, as told to Denny O'Neill and Steve Loyalehua. Me, Andy Mogger, nine years old, nice kid, lives in a suburban home with his parents, watches TV. Sometimes after Gilligan's Island, he watches the news. Bodies of Marines returning from Vietnam. Dad, why are all those guys getting killed? It's a war, Andy. I hope you never have to learn anything more than that. Andy doesn't think much about wars, bodies, small Asian countries, then. There's basketball to occupy his mind. Hanging out in the park with friends and beer. Working at Jones Beach during summer vacations. Going to college. It is there that television again brings the whole business of the war and the military back into Andy's life. Protect our vital American interests. I am asking that the Selective Service be revitalized. What interests does he mean? You know like oil. A question flashes through Andy's mind. He wants to trade my blood for another country's oil? And he remembers the images of body bags he had seen on television when he was a child. Well, if he says we gotta go, we gotta go. I'm not so sure. Andy feels pretty lonely at that moment. Is he the only one questioning the president? The next night he has his answer. Sound familiar? The current day, I'm very familiar. Uh, he attends a meeting with several hundred other students. As a vet, I know that registering for the draft might involve you in what they call military intervention. I know what that means. It means killing people. It means that the beast and man will be released. Atrocities will be committed. That's what registering for the draft could mean. What he hears that night makes sense to Andy, but not to everyone who's there. Bull! These draft registers are either cowards or they're too goddamn dumb to know what they gotta pay for what this country gives you. I'm gonna register in the morning. You coming with me? Man, I don't have any choice. If I don't, I won't get money for college. You're coming, aren't you? No. Why the hell not? Why is he wearing a Charlie Brown sweater? <laughs> Fighting won't solve the problems Vietnam sh Solving won't solve the problems. Vietnam showed us that. Or maybe you're chicken. Americans have always gone to fight for their country. Besides, you owe, owe this country. Maybe. But maybe there are other ways to pay the debt. Other ways, he begins by finding out what the problems really are. Problems of poverty in the US, in Central America, in Africa. Problems with nuclear war, with nuclear power, with the environment. Then he knows he has to speak out. Syracuse Federal Courthouse. 
It's clear to me that if I'm opposed to war, then I've got to work for world peace and justice and not against it. This is why I cannot register for the draft, even if it means going to jail. That would be me. If I register, I'll be helping to prepare for the war. I cannot participate in any way, not even by signing a piece of paper. And so it came to be. Mr. Mogger, you violated the law. Are you aware you could go to prison for three years? Sure. I will not kill other people. War is an immoral way of solving problems, and with the thousands of nuclear weapons stockpiled, it's suicidal. I'm proud to be here and standing up for what I believe in. I ask you to break out of your normal boundaries and create the changes necessary for a world of peace and justice. I agree that the law is perhaps wrong. Nevertheless, the law does not recognize religious or moral convictions or adherence to some kind of higher law as justification for committing a crime. Andy is convicted and sentenced to six months in prison. He is being led away. Hundreds of his friends and supporters demonstrate outside, demanding that they too be sentenced. Prison isn't fun, but Andy knows he'll get through it. And he does. As he leaves, he feels genuinely free, freer than he did when he came. So will you keep working for peace and breaking the law? Sure. Hundreds of thousands have not registered since 1980, but only 20 have been indicted. Of these 18 were protesters. Andy was just one. Yeah. That's what I would have done. That's what I would totally would have done. If I was in that position. Alright. So this is uh, a new one. Oh, okay. So it's an introduction into the next story. This so I guess it's like an Indian running away, and then it switches to, uh, he's running away from some sort of crusader. Calvary, kind of like relating to Vietnam, the chopper chasing after a Vietnamese. The more armed one, uh, definitely has the upper hand, of course, and... El Salvador, for God and our ruler, against all nations who would violate this territory. Blam! We must stem the tide of communism in Central America. There are Russians and Cubans in our backyard. A long time ago, and today. Philadelphia, 1986. Felipe, you're from El Salvador. Why don't you tell us what it was like in your own words? Before I came to the U.S., I worked with children in poor neighborhoods and attended seminary school. When I was still in high school, there was a national election. We knew our candidate had won, but... And I guess, uh, Army takes the voter's box. To... Probably mess with the boats I'm guessing people come from all over to gather in the plaza and I stopped there on my way home from school I stayed to listen until after dark dinner was ready two two hours ago Felipe she's standing there while he's doing something <laughs> I didn't read this story so I'm not too I read the other previous ones. At dawn we hear tremendous shooting, machine gun fire from downtown. So he goes out to see. Everything was shut down, the stores, the schools. And they're washing the blood away. And he's in shock. Miguel, what happened? This morning, the general's men opened fire on the protesters. No warning, nothing. 25 are dead. Some ran to hide in the church. They're arresting them now. Murderers! Assassins! About 300 people had gathered. Lies! Look at these lies! 
You print lies. Write the truth. We know who we voted for. Yep. So they mess with the votes. When I was running, I looked back and saw people falling down from the shots. It was like a dream. I just kept on running. People banged on doors to escape, but they wouldn't open up. They were too afraid. So the lady gets shot in the back. That night, a truck went by with corpses piled high like melons. Archbishop Romero refused to attend the new president's inauguration. I really admired him for that. That's when I went to seminary school. In 1980, the 63-year-old archbishop was gunned down in a church while serving mass. He had been outspoken about injustices to the poor. Besides working with children, I also volunteered to work with the legal aid office. This is the worst job of all. When someone reports a dead body, you will have to go out and identify it. That means taking pictures and describing in detail all the abuse the person has received, and of course the probable cause of death. Almost everybody has several bullet holes in the head. Many will also have an arm or a leg missing. Now they have started to cut off heads. You will find the head here and the body there. Most are tortured. Black marks from cigarette burns and electric shock. And other things I can't even talk about. I had to do this job every day. <sighs> Luan, do we use this? It could turn a lot of people off. Do it. They have to know. Oh, man. Things weren't easy. Everybody knows everybody in a small neighborhood. People got paid to squeal to the National Guard. They were looking for me, but by then I was sleeping in different houses every night. My father begged me to leave the country. Fifteen of my closest friends had disappeared. They never showed up alive again. Two kids I grew up with were dragged out of their houses. They were left almost unrecognizable. Horribly tortured. Their throats slit. I didn't want my family to suffer anymore. I came home for a few minutes one morning to say goodbye and get a few things. When I stepped out of the house... He started shooting at him. I kept on running all through the neighborhood until I got someplace safe. Less than a week later, I left El Salvador. I traveled north. This is hard to read for me. Americans working with Sanctuary helped me. Now I live with the U.S. and work for human rights in El Salvador. What do you think? I'm thinking what a time this is before joining up an American kid could actually sit down first and talk face to face with the enemy, a person they could later be sent out to kill. I don't know. Remember those guys I met flying to San Diego on their way to Navy boot camp? I couldn't resist trying some of this script out on them. The NAM stuff they thought was 260s. Nothing to do with them today. El Salvador, they couldn't tell from Nicaragua or Gu Guatemala. They got all excited, thinking they could end up heroes. Sent down to rescue the poor peasants from the National Guard. My minister told me I would be defending our right to worship against the communists who are trying to take everything over. Just let me sit... Just let them send me where they think they can shoot up a church like that where there, Romero. No, you didn't get it. Those are the guys our military is helping, and they're calling the priests communists. Read it again. In El Salvador, a country the size of Massachusetts, seven and a half tons of bombs drop every day. 2,339 people have been killed and over one million have been forced to flee their homes since 1984. In the 1550s, Indians throughout North Central and South America were pushed off their land. Their way of life was destroyed. By the 1880s, 14 families owned 60% of the land which they had turned into profitable plantations.
pay them too much and they drink it away. U.S. companies invested in coffee, sugar, bananas, and other crops in business partnerships in business partnerships with these descendants of the conquistadors. At about this time, figuring slave wages were all part of the deal. Nineteen thirty-two, La Matazin Matenza. Coffee workers' wages were cut in half because of the depression. The people revolted. General Martinez ordered a massacre. Thirty thousand peasants were killed in one week. Despite such terrors, Salvador the Salvadoran people have always resisted. Everyone went on strike. No one cooperated, and General Martinez was finally overthrown in nineteen forty-three. Even his own soldiers quit. The 1980s, many workers in El Salvador live on less than $100 a year. One out of four Sal Salvadoran children will starve to death this year. They can't take it anymore. They organize meetings, they demonstrate. Instead of trying to find solutions to our problems, our police and soldiers behave like criminals. Instead of raising wages or improving working conditions, they turn their guns on us. In the last five years, they have killed 50,000 of us. The plane goes by and drops these letters on the, this paper on the ground. People are reading it and crumpling up and throwing it away. It says, Salvadoran workers, the armed forces are proud to protect you while you work. Help your armed forces to guarantee the well-being of Salvadoran people. Many people in El Salvador feel that their country is at war with itself. With no way left other than to take up arms. For us, the war is not a little part of a bigger battle between the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. We want bread, and we want our lives to be respected when we demand these things. They answer us with death. The Reagan administration, as well as the right wing in El Salvador, always defines us as communist. Anybody who opposes them. That is the classic way of getting rid of their enemies. We have practically every ism in our groups. What unites us is the desire to transform the structures of our society, which are not fit even for pigs. The Salvadoran military gang is one of the bloodiest, most out of control gangs in the war world. Robert S. White Basically speaking propaganda, right? The U.S. trains, supplies, and advise Salvadoran military. A lot of this is, happens next door to El Salvador and Honduras. The U.S. has air, eight air bases there. Because we are not fully involved, your job will be to fly over El Salvador, locate the rebels, and then radio their coordinates to the Salvadoran pilots. They'll take it from there. So, he's running, just like we saw there in the first part. So our military puts the gun in their hands, aims it, puts their finger on the trigger, and then steps back so they can squeeze. How do we get across what this is, what they could be getting into when they join up to see the world? They want you to do something that doesn't square with your beliefs. You can get out. Here's my name and number. I didn't write down CCCO because they're probably going to take everything off you at basic. But try and remember CCCO, Central Committee for Conscientious Objectors. They'll help. Uh, I'll be okay. I ain't worried. Uh, lady, can I have that number? Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Hey, take care of yourselves. Keep your eyes open. And then they're off. And then there's all these uh, um, the writers and artists and stuff like that speaking and saying a bit uh, why they contributed to this comic. I'll just read the first one, unless you want me to read more. 
But uh, I contribute to real war stories for three reason, three reasons. Reasons. What am I? I'm gonna fight here. One, my father died a few months before I was born of an injury suffered while a member of the, while a member of the armed forces. Two, while in college, I re received crucial draft counseling from the American Friends Service Committee. This is my way of paying them back. And three, I had never written a comic book script based on an actual personal history and considered it an interesting technical exercise. Please note that I see every movie Clint Eastwood makes and like them. Steve Bissett, artist, for our children and their children's children, that they may embrace life rather than senseless death, creation instead of destruction. Amen to that. Brian Boland, artist, I have had no experience of military life, which would provoke me to make an anti-military statement. Why then, you may ask, do I, an Englishman, have the gall to stick my nose into a book about the American military? An answer would an, an honest answer would put ideology second to professional considerations. I enjoy working with Mike Barr, and he can talk me into anything. I've been meaning for a while to get some of my work inked by Mark Farmer, but I also consider the function of the true artist in society to be an irritant, to slightly upset the comfortable popular notion of the way things are. This book will ir irritate certain people. America! And for that reason, I'm glad to be in it. Mark Farmer, artist. After surviving over seven years under Margaret Thatcher's dictatorship, including that cleverly stage-managed stage -managed, vote-winning little affair in the Falklands, I thought few things could still upset me. However, working on this project has reminded me of the disturbing way people still rarely dedicate the one life they have to obeying the orders of others in subservitude, all aimed at killing other people. Voluntary slavery for legalized murder. Quite pathetic. Let's hope people have a broader view of things after reading real war stories. If I was to be totally honest, I also see this as one in the eye for the careers officers at school who suggest I consider the police or armed forces whenever I mention commercial art as a means of making a living. <laughs> in your face, armed <laughs> fucking careers officers. <laughs> I like these. I'm going to read them all. Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Huntington, artist. I want to work in comics that don't sell out. It's hard to make money without compromising your principles. I've been lucky so far, but I've also been hungry a lot. Most of the jobs I've worked are non-traditional for women, so I know something about what it's like for women in the military, having to work many times harder just to prove that you can lift, run machinery, do the job. I won a lot of Marksman Awards as junior member of the NRA, but when I grew up I realized that the games we're playing were based on romantic myth of macho heroism. Mark Johnson, Marco Polo, artist. During the eight years I lived in Guatemala, I loved and admired these almost extinct Mayan people who had mastered the art of living. I am contributing to this book because the people of Central America are being tortured, murdered, and starved so that we can consume coffee, bananas, beef, etc. at cheap prices. Steve Lealehoha, artist and writer. Yes, that's Hawaiian. <laughs> Nobody could pronounce his name. There were already 50,000 dead and half a million would die by the time I got drafted. It was obvious the military didn't have a clue about what to do short of occupying the whole country or bombing them back to the Stone Age. And I couldn't ignore the racial hatred clouding the issue, especially with my being related to all the ethnic groups of the Pacific Ocean. Doing alternative service as a conscientious objector allowed me to do something in the best interests of our country, and has prompted me to do this for you. Paul Maverides, artist, back cover. Back cover? What's a back cover? I don't know what a back cover is. Because there is no back cover. There's only a cover. <laughs> um, 
When I was 15 in 1967, a bunch of us closed down the Akron, Ohio draft board to protest the war in the draft. We were nearly all 15, 16, 17 years old. They locked the doors because we were trying to get inside to occupy the building. Rather than risk the embarrassment of arresting kids who weren't even draft age, they shut down until we left. Two days later, and I'm still not sorry. Oh, until they shut down until we left two days later. And I'm still not sorry. Alan Moore, writer. Because I have a deep aversion to all forms of violence and war. And if I have to explain, I must fall back on the pacifist slogan that says, A bayonet is an instrument with a worker on either end of it. Nancy O'Connor, colorist. It feels good to be a part of a book that works to balance the current epidemic of war glorifying propaganda fantasies such as Rambo and Top Gun. Denny O'Neill, writer. I've written a lot of comic book stories, something over 700. The one included here is a kind of atonement for some others I'm not proud of. Sam Parsons, colorist. My father was a conscientious objector during World War II. This book is important because something is needed to combat the powerful military ad campaigns. They are using the same psychology to, to sell us the military that they used to sell us as deodorants, jeeps, and blue jeans, and the ads work. Leonard Riffes, artist-writer. I was 18 in 1969. I remember how confusing it was to wrestle with the big questions about war, violence, God, patriotism, moral obligation, and Vietnam. John Totalben, artist. I prefer to let the story speak for itself. Tom Yates, artist. This is the last one. Whenever one American is kidnapped by terrorists sponsored by Libya, Iran, or maybe the USSR, our politicians display great theatrical outrage. Well, throughout much of this decade, the US-sponsored military of Guatemala and El Salvador averaged about 100 kidnappings a month, and their victims often end up tortured to death horribly. Nicaragua doesn't have this problem, for they, knew, for they threw out their corrupt military, who we now call Contras, and send millions to. Nicaragua is a democracy. Damn it. The floods of refugees coming into the U.S. from Central America are not running from the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, but the U.S.-backed countries of Guatemala and El Salvador. U.S. policies in Central America is inhumane, racist, and unjust. I was raised on American heroes who fought injustice, and I am compelled to do the same. I'm not even going to start talking about it. I'm just... 